Good morning, church. Today's scripture is from Acts chapter 21, uh, verses 8 through 16. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and delivers him into the hand of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to, go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not ready only to for I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem, and some of the disciples from Caesarea went up with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, and an early disciple with whom we should lodge. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. I want to say happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. Uh, my wife at times complains that, and I think, I don't know if I've done this intentionally or not, but every time my kids need anything, they always go to her. And so she shoulders far more of the load than I ever do. I don't know if it's because I'm not kind to my children or what, but uh, I think she's the kinder, gentler, more compassionate one, so she gets more of the load. So Happy Mother's Day. We're thankful for you. It makes my house run so much better, and my kids' lives are uh, much richer as a result. I, I want to begin today by uh, telling you about a story you may know about. In 1999, um, John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, took off in a plane. He was flying from New York to Massachusetts, going to their family home. It was he and his wife and his sister-in-law, and they were going to attend a wedding. Uh, now, John F. Kennedy, he'd been trained in flight, and so he'd learned all of the mechanics, you know, the takeoff and how to navigate the plane and ultimately land, fly, do all the things that you need to do. Uh, but one of the things that he hadn't learned to do well is to navigate using only his instruments. Uh, on this particular day, his flight got delayed once and then again, and, and it ended up that he wasn't going to be able to, be able to take off until after dark. They needed to get to the wedding, and so they chose to go on and make the journey. So they left the airport there, headed toward uh, Massachusetts, and an hour passed, and another, and another, and their plane uh, never landed uh, where it was supposed to be. Uh, so they, of course, they send out search parties, and they, they find the plane had crashed into the ocean. And as the investigators looked into the crash, trying to determine what had happened, uh, they determined that he'd become disoriented in the dark. Now, rather than using his instruments and flying and letting his instruments tell him how the plane was oriented and the direction in which they were headed, he'd, he'd chosen instead to rely on his sight in the midst of dark, and so he'd become disoriented. And while he thought the plane was headed safely toward his intended destination, he was actually flying directly into the ocean, and he didn't realize that until it was too late to correct. The plane crashed and killed everyone on board. Now, I, I tell you that story today because uh, many of us live our lives in the same way that uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. flew that plane. We attempt to live our lives uh, just by letting our senses guide us. Uh, if it feels good, I think I'm going to do that thing. If it seems painful or difficult, I'm going to stay away from that thing. Uh, if it's easy, we tend to gravitate toward those things. And rather than having a standard, an objective standard that we can look at to make sure that our lives are on the right course, many of us simply uh, lead our lives according to whatever our senses may tell us at the moment. Is this good? Does this feel bad? Now, the problem with that sort of thinking, um, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 tells us that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. And for many of us who are living our lives according to what seems right, this seems like the right thing to do. This feels like the right way to go. Um, the trouble for many of us, if we're not careful, is we could be headed toward destruction. Maybe you've experienced in your, this in your life. The relationship seemed promising. The investment looked like a great one. Uh, maybe the decision seemed wise at the time. And yet, if you've lived very long, um, if you're like me, uh, you've lived long enough that you can look back on decisions that you thought were fantastic at the time. And now looking back, you think to yourself, what 
in the world was I thinking? That was a terrible decision, a terrible investment. I don't know why I got in that relationship. Like we look back and we can see uh, that we have made mistakes in our lives, trying to go by what felt right at the time. And so the question for us is, is how do we um, stay on the right course? And in particular, how do we stay on the right course when things get difficult? When circumstances press in, when, you know, uh, living for Jesus Christ isn't uh, easy at certain times. So the question I want to answer for you today or attempt to answer is how do we obey God when it doesn't seem worth it? Have you ever had this experience in your life where you knew what God wanted you to do? Maybe God was prompting you to give a sum of money uh, to a charity or something. And yet as you look down at your budget and maybe your goals, the vacation you wanted to take, the things that you wanted to do, uh, it didn't seem worth it. Or maybe God was leading you to serve in a certain way. Maybe it was to share the gospel with someone. And you begin to think about all the negative consequences. If you do what God says, right? If I obey God, then here's what's going to happen. And, you know, the conversation is going to get awkward. And the relationship's going to be strained. And we begin to make excuses. And so rather than obeying God, uh, responding to his word or his spirit, we choose to go our own way, and it gets us into trouble. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 21. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, catch up on where we've been. If you weren't here last week, the Apostle Paul has been directed by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, which isn't all that bad of a thing. He was a Jew, right? Jerusalem, it's a great place to be. Uh, the problem is that the Holy Spirit had directed him and told him, hey, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and by the way, what awaits you there are bonds and afflictions. Paul, I want you to go to Jerusalem, but you're going to suffer there. I want you to go to Jerusalem, but you're going to be in prison. You're going to be put in chains. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be mistreated. So the apostle Paul, um, he gets together. He gathers together the Ephesian elders. He tells them what's going to happen. Of course, they don't want the apostle Paul to go, but he's going to be faithful to the Lord. And so they gather together, and they pray for him. And he sets sail, ultimately uh, headed toward Jerusalem. We'll pick up there in chapter 21. We'll read in verse 1. It says, and when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to coast, and next, the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. We had, when we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and, though the spirit, and through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem." So he'd heard this from the Ephesian elders, like, hey, Paul, I'm not sure that you should go to Jerusalem, like it's going to be difficult. And so he travels, he's making his way toward Jerusalem, and he lands at Tyre. And here the disciples, uh, through the Spirit, they had discerned what was going to happen to Paul. They knew the afflictions and the bonds that awaited him. And they're saying, Paul, I don't think this is a good choice of action. Like, this, this is not going to end well for you. And the circumstances didn't suggest that Paul should go there at all. I mean, if you would have been friends with Paul, maybe imagine that this is your family member or your child or your best friend, and they come to you and say, hey, I'm supposed to go to this place, and I need you to know I'm going to wind up in prison, and it's likely going to cost me my life. And what do you think? Should I go? And most of us say, absolutely not. Like, there's no, no way you should do that. You should live here. You should stay comfortable. Let's be honest. I mean, freedom is much better than imprisonment, right? Uh, a comfort much better than, than suffering, well-being better than uh, being beaten or persecuted. The circumstances suggested that Paul should stay, and yet the Spirit was directing that he should go. So how do we obey God when it doesn't seem worth it? How do we continue on when everyone would suggest that the direction that God is leading us isn't the best direction? Or when we look at the, the consequences of obeying God and we see the cost that will be there? Um, the first thing that I want you to see here if we're going to obey when it doesn't seem worth it, and we are the church of Jesus Christ, we should obey God even when it doesn't seem worth it. If we're going to do that, the first thing we've got to consider is the worth of God. Look, look here in verse 7. He's, he's leaving Tyre. He's heading on his voyage. Um, they arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. And on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. This is one of the seven, by the way, that they had appointed uh, to be the deacons of the church. So Philip, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen, um, he'd made his way now to Caesarea. They arrive at his house, 
um, Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own feet and hands. And he said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, and think about this, this is the author Luke who had been with Paul, who had seen him in prison before, who had seen him be beaten before. This is, the, this is Luke, the writer of, the, of this gospel, who's experienced the power of God coming through Luke. But look what, how Luke and all of those around him respond. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem. Why? For the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are going to obey when it doesn't seem worth it, we've got to consider the worth of Jesus Christ. Paul says, uh, because of Jesus Christ, because of who he is, because of what he has done, I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in his letter to the, to the Romans, the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 12, he wrote to them and he says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Obedience for the Apostle Paul was an act of worship. To go and to obey God, even when it didn't make sense, even when he knew suffering was on the horizon, it was his act of worship. He considered God. Consider him, Jesus, the Son of God, who stepped down out of heaven and he took on flesh. And he humbled himself even to the point of becoming a servant, a bond servant, who was obedient even unto death. This is who God is. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, who gave up his life on the cross for us, that we might find life. And when we look to the worth of God, his perfection, his holiness, his power, his love, his goodness, his grace, his mercy upon us, what we should rightly conclude is that God is worthy of our obedience, even when it doesn't make sense. You think about this. Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, he came, he took on flesh, he was the Messiah. Um, he obeyed God, even unto death. And we look at how God use that obedience. You look at how God was at work, and that obedience, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for the Son of God to die. It didn't make sense for the King of kings and the Lord of lords to take on flesh. And yet, that act of obedience meant the salvation of the world. The Apostle Paul, who urges the Romans to consider his mercy uh, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You think about what mercy the Apostle Paul had been shown. The Apostle Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees, trained under Gamaliel, one of the leading scholars of his day, who was zealous for the traditions of his fathers to the extent that he persecuted the early church. He would go and get letters from the synagogues, and he would find Christians, men and women all over, and he would drag them through the streets bound, and he would throw them in prison. The Apostle Paul a man who once bound and imprisoned men and women, persecuting believers for their faith, is now willing, because the worth of Jesus Christ, because he had been shown mercy, he was now willing to be bound and imprisoned on behalf of God. If you think about what we truly deserve as men and women, sinful people, what we deserve is eternal separation from God in the place called hell. And yet, because of the mercy of God, we have been accepted by him. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus. He's worthy of our worship. Who are we to say we wouldn't endure difficulty or opposition in obedience to Jesus Christ? He is worthy. Maybe you could consider what God has forgiven you, the mercy that he's shown to you, the sin that, that he's forgiven, that he atoned for through his blood on the cross, Consider his worth. And may that spur you on to obedience, even when it doesn't make sense. The second thing uh, that I would want you to hear here, why we would obey when it doesn't seem worth it, um, is we consider the costs. 
For many of us, uh, we're well acquainted with the cost of obedience, right? Uh, Maybe for you, if it's in sharing your faith, uh, you know what happens when you go to share your faith with somebody, right? I'm going to get nervous. I'm going to get tongue-tied. I'm going to sweat. I'm going to be anxious. I'm not going to say the right things. I'm going to look a little bit foolish. And again, we continue on with that. Uh, This might affect the relationship. It might hurt their feelings. How are they going to respond? We are very, very well acquainted with the cost of obedience, And at the same time, um, in other ways, um, we might even think toward the rewards of disobedience, right? Hey, if I do this, it's going to feel really good. If I do this, man, I'm going to get to to have money in the bank, or I'm going to get to, you know, it's going to look good for me. If I'm a little bit dishonest, the deal's going to work out. Like we look to the rewards of disobedience. But I want you to know this. Obedience to Jesus Christ always leads to abundance, and disobedience always leads to destruction, even if you can't see it in the moment. So when we consider the cost, we weigh the cost of obeying Jesus Christ, we should always consider what God will do with our obedience and the destruction that will come with disobedience. Now, sometimes we don't feel this, right? This isn't what we see in the moment. Um, my, my children, we, they're old enough that we get to leave them home a little bit now, so my wife and I can go out for a date, and uh, it's cheaper, right? And we can have a conversation over dinner, and so that's really nice. And yet, we usually leave our kids with some instructions like, hey, um, don't eat snacks for dinner, right? Maybe you have a sandwich, there's something in your refrigerator, like have something decent. And so my youngest in particular, he has a hard time seeing the benefits of obedience, right? And, and, he, and the negatives of disobedience. And so when it comes to the, the, the chocolate popsicles in the freezer, he has a hard time telling himself no. And we're like, hey, look, there's some really negative consequences, like too much sugar, you're going to get diabetes, like long term. He can't see those at all, right? He's like, I want another fudge sickle. That's what I love, you know? And yet for us as adults, as silly as it is to sometimes see kids and the things that they want to eat and the way they want to live, we do the exact same thing. As his parents, we know better. He shouldn't eat fudge sickles for dinner, right? It's not going to be healthy. It's going to long-term lead him to a lot of pain. And yet our Heavenly Father, who loved us enough to die on the cross that we might truly live, has given us His Word, and He's given us His Spirit to lead us to this life of abundance. Obedience always leads to abundance. God loves you. He wants the best for you. And even when you can't see how it's going to work out, God uses your obedience for good. It leads to abundance in your life. And, and the truth of it is, we have an enemy who came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Disobedience always leads to destruction. Every single time. And as just like kids, sometimes as adults, we reason with ourselves. No, I think it's worth it. No, it'll, it'll be okay. There won't be any negative consequences. And I tell you that I've um, been in the ministry for quite a few years now. I've never met anyone who set out to ruin their marriage or destroy their family. I've never, never met anyone who thought, yeah, I just want to like blow the thing up and cause a lot of pain. But in the moment, it's easy for us to see hey, there's a reward to disobedience, there's a cost to obedience, and I don't, I don't want that. Um, and we take steps of disobedience that ultimately lead to destruction. Some of you are here today, and you're crossing a line with a friend or a co-worker. I guess no big deal. No one has to know. I'm in control of this. It's never going to get out of hand. Disobedience always leads to destruction. Every single time. Maybe for you, you need to go home today. You need to have a conversation. You need to drag your sin out of the darkness into the light. Obedience always leads to abundance. And that might be hard for you. Today's the day of confession. Maybe some of you are trading your family for a bigger paycheck. And rather than serving God and living as a, a husband and a father and you know, being the godly man you need to be, you're, you know, your God is really money. I tell you, disobedience always leads to destruction. And if you could fast forward to the end of your life and look back, um, you would not be thankful for the extra time you spent at work. You would long for uh, the, the opportunity to invest in your kids and spend time with your spouse. Obedience always leads to abundance, and disobedience always leads to destructions. Some of us, and I say us because this is me too, um, I was convicted just a couple of weeks ago about putting off a conversation with someone whom I love, 
I've literally prayed for 10 years for him to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Man, I love him and I care about him and I want to see God change his life. I remember sitting in a ball game, standing right next to him. And there I thought, you know, it's really not the right time or the right place. And it was going to be awkward. It was going to be a little difficult. And I put it off. Y'all, we never know how many opportunities we have to obey Jesus Christ to share the gospel. I mean, I, pr- I pray God gives me another opportunity. But our decisions, even when it seems difficult, even when we can come up with good excuses for why we shouldn't obey, our decision to obey or disobey, they have profound consequences for us. So we obey even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's difficult, by looking to the worth of God. He's worthy of our obedience. Then we consider the cost, that obedience always leads to abundance and disobedience always leads to destruction. And the final thing that we do is we follow Jesus in faith. The Apostle Paul, um, he sets out from Caesarea, and he goes into Jerusalem. And just as the Spirit said, um, he faces arrest and chains and imprisonment. Uh, he goes on from Jerusalem. He's eventually going to make his way uh, to, to Rome. He's going to appear before Caesar. He'll be imprisoned there for quite some time. But along the way, and everywhere the Apostle Paul went, he took the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. He wrote to the church in Philippi. He said, uh, Hey, I have good news for you because my imprisonment has turned out for the greater advancement of the gospel, such that uh, the entire praetorian guard, kind of the, uh, the, the guard who were watching him, who were uh, very connected with the governor's household, uh, they'd come to know who Jesus was. They'd come to hear the gospel. And the Apostle Paul is celebrating that his obedience to go to Jerusalem has now placed him in a Roman prison where the Praetorian Guard has heard the gospel, and it didn't stop there. Everywhere Paul went, the gospel of Jesus Christ began to spread. Within years, Christianity had taken root there in Rome. Within decades, it had begun to to spread far beyond the city of Rome, now uh, the Roman Empire. Within 200 years, it was the dominant religion of the most powerful empire on the face of the earth. And within a couple of millennia, the gospel will have spread around the globe such that every single one of us in this room, because I've shared it here today, you have heard the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that you might not uh, be separated from God in eternity. In fact, the just punishment for your sin, but you might enjoy a relationship with God and spend eternity with Him in heaven. We consider the worth of God. We weigh the costs of both disobedience and obedience, and we follow Jesus Christ in faith. Every moment of Paul's difficulty, every instance of suffering, every day of his imprisonment was worth it. Because God was working all of them for his good and for God's glory. Romans 8, 28, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. It says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And just as God took the Apostle Paul and he sent him to Jerusalem, promising that there would be difficulty there, There would be struggles, there would be pain, there would be imprisonment. And he used the Apostle Paul's imprisonment there to spread the gospel around the globe. I want you to know that God has a purpose for your pain as well. God has a reason behind every act of obedience they would ask you to follow. And he's going to use all of those things ultimately for your good and for his glory. As the church of Jesus Christ, the trouble for us is we've uh, become indistinguishable from the world around us. Uh, When Surveyors do polls and they, you know, kind of take the pulse of our nation. They find that Christians make most of the same decisions that unbelievers make, both with regard to uh, who we marry, uh, what we consume in terms of substances, illegal and legal. Like, we have not become distinguished from the world because many of us have said, you know what, obedience isn't worth it. If it doesn't make sense, I'm not going to do it. You know, Jesus Christ died on the cross. He gave his life that we might live the abundant life, find new life in him and freedom from the things of this world. So today I want to encourage you to obey Jesus Christ even when it doesn't make sense. When you encounter the things in his word that you struggle with that seem to go against the grain of our culture, obey Jesus Christ even when it doesn't make sense.
The great tragedy of the death of John F. Kennedy Jr. is he had everything right at his fingertips that he needed in order to pilot that plane safely to his destination. But he chose to try and make it on his own. He got disoriented, and he died in a fiery crash. Some of you are on the same path. Today I want to encourage you to just respond in obedience to Jesus Christ, to stop right where you are. Stop the way that you've been going, the path that you've been taking. Stop right where you are. Confess that to Jesus Christ and turn and begin to respond in obedience to him. I want to ask you a question today. What step of obedience are you resisting? Confession of sin, that you may be healed? Responding in believers' baptism after faith? It's beginning to give and trust God with your finances? Walking in community with other believers? Beginning to use your gifts in service to other people? What step of obedience are you resisting? And I'll ask it another way. Um, what area of your life are you refusing to surrender to God? Because Many people will say, uh, God, you can have my life, but don't take my money. Or God, you can have my money, but don't mess with my sexuality. God, you can have my family, but don't ask me to walk in integrity in my business. God, you can have my Sunday, but don't ask for the rest of the week. God is worthy of our obedience. Our obedience always leads to abundance. So let's respond to Jesus Christ in faith. Now, here's the great news for all of us. The Apostle Paul, who spent his life, or his early life, um, really rebelling against God, persecuting the church, imprisoning believers, he stood and gave approval as a man was stoned to death for faith in Jesus. Man, he'd blown it in pretty much every way imaginable. And yet God poured out his grace and his mercy upon the Apostle Paul. If you're here today, and you feel like the Apostle Paul, and you've blown it in every way imaginable, I want you to know that the Apostle Paul would want to write to you about the mercy of God, about his grace, about the salvation that's available to you in Christ Jesus, that God forgives the greatest of sinners, and God can forgive you. So once again, I want to encourage you to respond in obedience to Jesus Christ. If he's drawing you to faith today, would you trust him and make that public? Let people know that you've trusted him and responded in faith today. Would you bow with me? Jesus, we do thank you for your word and for your spirit, that you do guide us. And Lord, that your path, that narrow path that most people miss, it is the path to true and abundant and eternal life. Father, may we walk that as your church. Lord, as believers who live in a world that often points us in the wrong direction, Maybe we're surrounded by people at work who would applaud us walking in dis disobedience to you, and they might even shun us for walking in obedience. Father, would you help us to see your worth? Would you help us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to you? Would you help us to be the church of Jesus Christ in this city? And Lord, we just pray that you would, through our obedience, in the same way that you used the Apostle Paul and Peter and all the men throughout Acts, God, would you use us to spread the gospel around this place and wherever you may send us, to redeem it for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.